Hello, I hope you are well today. This is the part 9 of the Crafting Isekai Manga Recap. If you want to catch up to this part, I would highly suggest you to check the card on the top right. Drop a like and subscribe for more awesome videos, thank you very much. Before the harpy sets out to attack, Kosuka tells them to prioritize their safety and pay close attention to their allies to avoid catching them in the blast. After this the harpy sets off to attack, and seeing them fly off Kosuka hopes it goes well. Seeing him this agitated Silphy worries about him. Suddenly Kosuka summons a binocular and runs off. Kosuka then climbs the wall and looks through his binocular. He spots the harpies heading toward attack. Silphy then interrupts him asking if he was nervous. Well obviously Kosuka was nervous since in his world, he was just an ordinary person who's never gotten into a fight. But didn't he fight against Gizmas earlier Silphy wonders. Kosuka tells her those weren't humans so it ain't same and Silphy corrects him stating whether it be humans, elves or gizmas there's no difference since they are all lives. Hearing this Kosuka was stunned, he realizes she was right, but it would have been easier if he could just easily stop worrying about it altogether, but it wasn't that simple. His life in this world has been worlds apart from the one he had on earth, and that too in an exciting way. Well in a bit too exciting way. Kosuka tries to forget about these thoughts, since there's no mistaking that he was not in the right state of mind. Suddenly Silphy calls his name and hugs him from behind. Well it was funny of her to say this when she's the one that put him in this situation, but if it's too hard for him, then he doesn't have to push himself. He have already helped them enough, and they are basically relying on him. Furthermore no one is telling him to stain his hands with blood, so he doesn't have to do this. Then suddenly a large blast was heard from afar. Both of them were shooked. Kosuka then tells Silphy that he still has responsibility, as he grabs her hand. The weapons Kosuka made are now being used in war, so there's no way he can say that he only made the weapons and didn't kill them directly so he's innocent, this couldn't pass. And now that he have made up his mind, he just have to see through it. Silphy then holds him tighter as she thanks him. Sometimes later harpies come back, it seems that they manage to stop the Holy Kingdom's pursuit and before noon they meet with Jujira's unit, and by afternoon the liberated people started arriving. Accommodating everyone took them until night, then the liberated people got medical treatment and sufficient rest, and later countermeasures against the Holy Kingdom were discussed. Next morning the liberated people were divided into three groups and one departed every other day. Silphy and half of the liberation unit were staying back for the sake of defense and surveillance and Kosuka made his way through the wilderness while expanding the shelter. And after five days' worth of trek they finally arrive at the frontline base by the evening. Everyone at the frontline base welcomes Kosuka and the party. Lamy Girl guides the refugees to Central Plaza to register themselves, while Danin talks with Kosuka about the previous event. Harpies were talking among themselves about their new way of fighting which was cooler than the previous way of dropping poop from the sky. Danin asked Kosuka if the expansion of the shelter was done? Well it was perfectly done since now it can fit 500 people comfortably, and up to a 1,000 if they cram them in. Danin then tells Kosuka to get some rest since he did a great deal of work. Well Kosuka quickly had to go back to the fort by tomorrow since he had some small thing to deal with. And while both of them were having a conversation, someone pulls Kosuka's cloak, he looks back, and it was Aira. With a cheeky grin Aira tells him she had something she wants him to look at. Kosuka wonders what it was since she was very confident about it. Jokingly, Kosuka tells her that he is a very hard person to get surprised. Aira then remarks that seeing that thing would make her eye pop out of his head. Then they head for the workshop. Outside the workshop Aira tells him to wait for a bit since she had to prepare that thing for him to see. Aira and the other girl heads inside while they wait. And Kosuka wonder what she would show him. Sykes tells him to look forward for it. She was done after a while and tells him to come in. Kosuka was uncertain about the thing that she was about to show, and Aira tells him to decide it after he sees it. Then with a broad smile she tells him to feast his eyes. Suddenly Kosuka was surprised, as in front of him Aira and the other girl were wearing a school bag with old receiver and an antenna attached to it. That design was quite dodgy and out of this world, so Kosuka wonders was this supposed to make his eyes pop out of its socket? He then asks what the hell was that? Aira with a snarky laugh tells him that it was a prototype of the golem communication device. Hearing this he was very shocked. 
With the sun shining onto the base, the new day began. Kosuka woke up in his bed, and he felt something was latched onto him. He pulls the sheet to find Aira hugging onto him, while she was barely dressed. He then caught a sight of her tiny boobus, which made him wonder if they did something previous night. But while he still had his clothes on so they couldn't have done it, at least that's what he want to believe. Well yesterday at night he remembers being shown the golem communication device. He was shocked to see it built so damn fast. Well it did take quite a lot of effort to shrink it down to that size and it was all Era's idea. She then asks him to praise her a bit more or maybe give a head pat as well. After all what she did was pretty amazing and Kenichi expected nothing else from the genius alchemist. Later they decided to test out its effective range. But then Lamia girl comes in. And since Kosuka was here it was the perfect time to show him some prototypes. She then lays out a quick climb cooking pouch, a pot shield and a portable cooking fire on the table. Kosuka was very amazed by all the new inventions, and that's when they kept talking until pretty late at night. And lastly he remembers sleeping in the room next to the workshop, but then a silhouette opens the window. And it was the Lamia girl who wanted to go over the improvements they discussed last night, but seeing Kosuka in bed with half-dressed era. She was awestruck, and she tells him to take their time, but before Kosuka could explain any further, Aira woke up in a daze, he then asks her why she was in his bed with nothing but her underwear? Aira then started to explain when he went to bed first she was going to sleep in the other bed, but the blanket was too thin and it was cold, so she figured it would be warmer to sleep with Kosuka instead, but she could have worn clothes if it was too cold, while well, her clothes might get wrinkled and this is the way she always sleep. Kosuka then tells her it's not right to just jump into a man's bed. What would she do if he might have eaten her up? Well let's just say he wasn't ready to hear Era's answer. Because she was fine with it, cause things are never dull when she is with him. His power, ideas and knowledge never fail to surprise and inspire her. And that's why she always want to be with him. Kosuka was glad to hear that but he still have Sylphie in his heart. Era knows they both love each other and she is not intending to get in between them. She is just hoping Kosuka would allow her to stay close to him. And is it too much to ask? Well it's not yet. He is still unsure how the relations between people of opposite sex work in this world. Then he suggested to first start as friends. Hearing that Era was sad because haven't they already been friends until now? Caught in this strange dilemma. Kosuka rephrases that. How about more than a friend but not quite a girlfriend? Era then wonders if this means he will accept her? Well let's just take it slow and talk it over with Silphy first. Aira knows the importance to respect the hierarchy, and it seems Melty was placed in the third without her consent. Kosuka was relieved that they came to an understanding, so now they decided to get dressed and have breakfast. Later while Aira was wearing her clothes, Kosuka notices her wearing a warm expression which put his worries to ease. But how is he going to explain this to Silphy? Later outside the courtyard, Pilna stood there shocked out of her mind while Kosuka was sitting there surrounded by other harpies. Aira then reconfirms that Kosuka has accepted her. Realizing she has been left out, Filna was quite shocked. She then notices the other harpies' closeness with Kosuka, and their relation being so close freaks her out more. Quivering, she comments how Kosuka have become so friendly with Fronte and others. While well, they did spend few days together, so there was a lot of opportunities, and we aren't gonna talk about what happened while he was unconscious. Pilna then got depressed because if only she was in same unit with Fronte and others, things could have been different. Danin then approaches Kosuka and asks if he was planning to go back to the shelter by himself. Well yeah he was planning to. It was gonna be a short trip, but he really didn't want to go back by himself. Danin too decided to appoint someone to accompany him, and taking this chance, Pilna excitedly flapped her wings asking to take her with him. She could be one of the people to accompany him like Kosuka's previous trip. Plus she can serve as additional aerial bombardment for the shelter. Well this sounded reasonable to Danin, and it would be a relief to have the harpies with them. So they decided to let Pilna accompany Kosuka. Aira then gives her a mean look, which made Pilna wonders if something was wrong. Aira warns her no funny business, well of course. Aira then states she have her highness's approval, depressed Pilna understands. She will try to restrain herself, which seems fine by Aira. Hearing all this Kosuka felt like his chastity was becoming a commodity, but it could also be his imagination. Kosuka then spots Danin looking at him. Embarrassed Danin tells him one should always prepare themselves for the worst, and Kosuka couldn't agree more. Even Danin should also prepare himself. After all Kosuka heard about the widow who was making advances on Danin, 
He then tries to dodge the situation stating he doesn't know what was Kosuka talking about, and he also had work to do so he decided to excuse himself. And that's how that day came to an end. Few days later Silphy welcomes Kosuka with open arms, and he was happy to see her after so long. Silphy then hugs him stating she was glad to see him back safe and sound, but it seems the hug was too strong for Kosuka, and he had to squeal to make her stop. Seeing Kosuka out of his breath, Silphy got worried and apologizes. Danan then comes in asking if the liberated people have safely made it back to the frontline base. Kosuka confirms they should have reached the point, and then Kosuka plans to make contact with Era through the new communication tool. Seeing a backpack in his hand everyone were confused, and that's the reaction he expected from them. Later they realized the backpack wasn't making any sound, but Pilma was sure that she was able to talk to Era from the fourth shelter. Hearing that Kosuka theorizes that maybe the magical waves can reach the temporary shelter. And it looks like the range limit is about four days of travel so it can't reach five. Kosuka then tells them about how Era and the others were trying to come up with a relay station that's supposed to increase the range on the telecommunicators. While well, Sylphie did wanted a mean of communication. But she didn't think they would get there this fast. Well it is hard to believe. Now with this device they will have means of communication during ambushes or pincer attacks and defenders can quickly relay information about enemy attacks, and if the harpies are circling around while wearing this they can quickly warm them of attacks which would be pretty useful. Hearing this all the harpies were very impressed by Kosuka's idea. Silphy then picks up the backpack, and she now realizes that this thing can fundamentally change the war, while well, she was damn right about it. Suddenly a harpy came to report about the enemy forces which have started making their moves, and she thinks they'll be arriving near this fort before sunset. Hearing this Kosuka was shocked, cause they aren't prepared to fight yet. Well there are 5,500 units heading towards them with cavalry men, infantry and archers combined. And the enemy's numbers are five times larger than the liberated people who escaped to the frontline base. But it was a good thing they don't have their sights on the black forest. But Kosuka was more worried if they arrived before sunset then they would start attacking as soon as tonight. So what can they do? Well Kosuka doesn't have to worry. Cause smug Silphy reminds him about the thing they rigged up the shelter with. So using that they can abandon the shelter and blow the whole thing up. Cause Kosuka did put the explosives there for such occasions. And he put them all the way under the pavement and inside the walls. So if just one block explodes the chain reaction will take out the entire fort. But still Kosuka thought he can't fit more than 5,000 in this shelter. Well they can just leave some supplies in the warehouse pretending they have escaped which will lead them there. Then they can build a watchtower in the mountain and have the explosives detonate at the best time. Later when the evacuation was complete, Silphy told Kosuka to dig up the tunnel here. And then she told the harpy to check if everything was in order. Then Silphy used the camouflage to cover up the entrance. And now they are open for business. As for food they have boxes of cookies and dried fruits and water which should be enough for them. And from here they can watch the fort clearly without anyone noticing them. Kosuka then realizes that he might have gone a bit overboard with the interior design, but the others liked it a lot. Later Kosuka pulled out the detonator and explained how to use it, and it seems Pilma understood. Now that the preparations are complete they are now ready for what's next. Silphy then called for Pilma, Flam and Pesser, and she tells them to stay here and take care of monitoring and detonation, which they happily agreed. Kosuka then tells them to be careful and not get hurt. Hearing this they got too emotional and thanks him for worrying about them, cause soon they'll join him tomorrow after confirming the results. So now it's time for Silphy and Kosuka to head to the fourth shelter. Sometimes later, Kosuka informs the main base about the shelter's situation via the backpack telecommunicators, and everyone around him were surprised to see it actually work. It seems the signal can't really reach the shelter, while Aira assumed so because she never got any contact from them. Well anyways Kosuka tells her to contact him if they see any movement, then they ended the connection. Suddenly everyone surrounded Kosuka and started various questions about the backpack telecommunicator, to which he tells them to ask one at a time. So Sir Lionel asks the first question, when are they going to have dinner? Later after they had their meal, Silphy asks Kosuka how he has been cause it's been seven days since they last spent time together. Well he doesn't have anything particular to say about the trip. But after he got to Fort Era took him to the workshop to show the communication device. And she should have seen Era's big smug face about it. Well to Sylphie that does sounds like Era. But the communication device was amazing to her. 
well it's valid because it is quite useful in a whole bunch of purposes. And lastly Kosuka does have one final thing to tell. He tells Sylphie about how Era confessed to him, and Sylphie with a smile says it took longer than she expected. So did he gave her an answer? Well Kosuka agreed to be something more than a friend but no more than something like a lover. But still Sylphie is the person Kosuka loves the most. For an example if Sylphie accepts another man's confession, Kosuka knows he'd get so mad and jealous that he might beat the guy to death and off himself. Well it sure was a lot for Sylphie. She have already told Kosuka that it's a man's responsibility to have a lot of wives. The more wives he marry, the more responsibility he would have. After all a husband who lets his wife and children go hungry can no longer be called a man, and his wife would divorce him, and then he will disgrace himself for life. Same goes for men who hit on women with a partner. That's why he doesn't have to worry about something like that happening. And as for Aira, she have no problem with it. Because she have known her for a long time, she knows they would get along well. She tells him that while squishing Mini Kosuka. And furthermore, it would be nice if he and Aira tried for a baby. But Kosuka wasn't thinking that far ahead. Suddenly they felt a small tremble, which was from the shelter going ablaze. And it seems everyone felt it too. Sylphie then asks if this could be an earthquake, and Kosuka tells her it's the explosion from the fort. Pilna, Flam and Pesser were observing the shelter from the hidden base. It seems the shelter was surrounded by the Holy Kingdom Army's treasured squadron. According to Pilna the calculation for the area of impact was done, and Flam was thinking if they are really going to light up the night sky. Pesser then spots the soldiers invading the fort, so she quickly sends a report. The enemy has begun the invasion and it seems they have realized the fort has been deserted. Flam insists it's their chance, and Pesser theorizes the soldiers are probably planning to use the fort as a bridgehead to conquer the Omit wilderness. Pilna then plans to detonate it once they confirm the fort's been filled. Pesser then wonders if it will really explode, but Pilna doesn't doubt that Kosuka-san is going to blunder. Flam then reports that the soldiers have filled the fort, so now it's time to prepare to detonate. Pilna then presses the lever, after which a bright light surrounds the fort. Sylphie and Kosuka too spots the bright light from far away in this barren land. It seems Pilna and her team have detonated it, and to be able to see even the light caused by the explosion all the way here, it must have packed quite a punch. Sir Lionel and the other approaches them wondering if this vibration and the bright light are from the shelter? Well yeah it's from blowing up the nearby fort. Sumo then wonders if they are going to launch a follow-up attack? Well, Sylphie already planned to head to the third shelter before the daybreak and retreat to the first frontline fort as planned, then they'll move according to Pilna and her team's report. Sylphie then tells the others to please increase the number of scouts. Sir Lionel then theorizes if the explosion was heard all the way here then surely they must have died in the blast. Well, it would have been a record if this was in regular battle. Hearing this Kosuka wonders if this will be on record if everyone died from the explosion. He then checks his list wondering if this will count as an achievement, while Sophie orders the other to get plenty of rest. And to his surprise he got an achievement called Philanderer which increases his offense by 10% on opposite sex. But Kosuka was already too annoyed by this system having such weird achievements. But he calms himself down, and checks again for something new. And to his surprise he got quite a lot of new achievements. Looking at his expression Sophie wonders what's up with him. Well it seems like 3,000 people died from that attack alone. Sylphie then wonders, how did he know that? Kosuka then realizes that he have never mentioned things like achievement and levels to her yet. So he starts to tell her how in a game when one completes a certain quests and missions, he would get a trophy or an achievement which will earn him a skill point to distribute. And after further explaining everyone about this concept of achievement, it seems no one understood a single thing. Kosuka then summarizes that with every condition he clear he gets something called a title and a skill comes with it. Sylphie then speculates that with every action Kosuka takes, God bestows upon him a new skill. Well she can just think it like that. Kosuka then further explains that the more enemies he defeat the more experience he will earn. And then he can freely use that experience to increase his skill as he sees fit. Hearing this the people in the crowd wonders if it means the other worlders are God's apostles and which god's apostles could Kosuka be. Seeing them theorize all this Kosuka was quite shell-shocked. Suddenly Sylphie tells them to end this conversation here and to get some proper rest. Next day around dusk at the third shelter, Pilna and her group were back from the previous shelter. She reports how they have successfully blew up the nearby fort, and the impact was unbelievable. 
Well, that blast was truly spectacular. Flam and Pessa were both confused about what to do, while the survivors from the blast were battered by the debris. Pilna tells others to scout around under the cover of dark as planned. And Flam was the one who went to scout, and she was shocked to see that there's not even so much as a ruin left behind. Moreover, the number of foot soldiers who can move were less than 20%, which was quite shocking. Pilna then further tells them about how after midnight the gizmas came crawling out, and by just hearing that Silphy and the others knew what might have gone down. It seems the remaining soldiers were attacked by the horde of gizmas, and they were quickly obliterated and devoured by them, and that sight was truly horrendous. Sir Lionel speculates that the soldiers are pretty much obliterated, but he didn't think that Kosuka's power was this fearsome. Well, in the end there weren't even a hundred survivors so the army retreated and that concludes Pilna's report. Looks like their worries for second attack were for naught, and now they are certain that the Holy Kingdom's army will need some time to regroup, so they plan to use this time to think about their next move. Later Kosuka reports about their success to make the Holy Kingdom forces retreat, much to Era's surprise. Well, Pilna and her team confirmed it themselves so he believes this information is pretty accurate. Era then asks if Kosuka was okay? Because ain't it painful knowing that he killed so many people? Well, Kosuka is fine maybe because it hasn't sunk in yet, or maybe because he didn't see it with his own eyes. Era then comforts him stating she will pamper him a lot once he gets back. Hearing that Silphie had quite an angry expression, and her deadly stare was directed toward Kosuka. Silphie then asks if he really want to get pampered by Era? Well, he remembers how nice he felt when he hugged Era and laid on her lap, and remembering that moment was enough for mini Kosuka. And as for my cultured viewers, it's on chapter 33. Kosuka then tells her that it wasn't that bad of an idea, to which Silphie asks if she should pamper him too, and with an pervy look, Kosuka directly laid on Silphie's lap calling her mama. Seeing him act like a baby and after looking at his reaction, she realizes it is quite a nice feeling. Well, she doesn't have to worry cause next turn will be Silphie's. The next morning, Sir Lionel tells Kosuka it is not commendable to put a burden on their princess. Well, in Kosuka's defense, he didn't put any burden on her physically. Then Sir Lionel wonders what exactly did he do, cause the sun was already out, and Princess was still cooped up in her chamber. Then we see Silphie crawled up in a blanket, constantly stating it wasn't me. Outside Kosuka didn't reply to Sir Lionel cause he wants to protect Silphie's pride. But the constant stares from the girls were kind of embarrassing. It seems they were misunderstanding something cause he only pampered Silphie after what she did to him, and she just self-destructed from all the pampering he gave her. Earlier at night, Silphie was laying in Kosuka's lap with a very pleased expression. It seems doing this awoken a very weird kink from deep inside her. She then asks him to pat her head more, and Kosuka tells her to try begging some more. Silphie then changes her expression stating she will cry if he doesn't pat her more, and this ended up getting her the head pats she wanted. But Kosuka obviously can't tell them they are doing this kind of play. Silphie then slides down from the shelter. The harpies then gathered around her asking what happened, to which Silphie guided them to different place to speak. Now that everyone was out of the temporary base, Kosuka began dismantling it. From there he notices Silphie talking to the group of girls. As Kosuka was done the girls also came back after their secret talk. Pilna then tells Kosuka that after their talk they have declared Kosuka-san as not guilty, and hearing this constant talk Silphie slowly started getting embarrassed and she finally broke, she then began screaming like crazy, to which the harpies quickly flew. Kosuka then tells her to calm down because people have their own preferences, and after hearing this Silphie went berserk and started chasing them down, and this is how they ran until the day ended, but thanks to that they managed to recover the time they lost. Sometimes later Kosuka was back at the workshop, then everyone greets him cause it's been a while. Someone then asks about Silphie? Well she was in a meeting with Danin and others to share intel. Some girls then asks where was Sykes. Well he was a little tired so now he's sleeping, but he gave him some medicine so he'll be alright. It seems the night with the girls were quite rough for him. Later they discuss about new idea to supply magic power from the mic handle, but that could pose problem for people like Kosuka who can't use magic. Well he was an exception among exceptions, but still it would be better to think about cases like this. Well they surely can make some internal space, so they decided to try distributing magic preservation stones around by next time. QB then wonders if they are using some kind of blueprint, or something? Well they don't need that because this way they can keep the secrets under wraps. 
and in the end they can just register it with Kosuka's crafting skill and mass produce it. Well as Kyuubi thought Kosuka's power were really unbelievable. Kosuka then asks the girls what they were currently working on. Firstly they have a magic wave relay device, then they have variety of golem powered devices, a developing magic gun, and they are also mass producing magic swords, and lastly they are crystallizing the magic power from the underground vein. But Kosuka already know about the magic wave relay device and the golem powered devices, but it was his first time hearing about the rest. Lamia girl first showed the prototype of the magic gun, they took a reference from the rifle that Kosuka showed them before. They then changed it to muzzle loading due to power issues. As for the discharge mechanism they are combining fire and wind magic, and now they are in the middle of perfecting that combination. Kosuka finds it amazing that these girls could develop this magic gun all by themselves. But what about the magic sword and the vein thing? Well for the magic sword they just imbue some magic formula into blade. And as for the vein it is pretty much an infinite power source so now they are trying to find a way to extract the magic in a crystallized form and utilize it. They then have a little talk while QB checks out the magic gun. The other girl then asks what was he working on. Well he was trying to make miso and soy sauce cause the military preparation was already going pretty well so he thought it would be nice to start developing a new culinary product. But the others couldn't understand what was he talking about. Later Kosuka tried to craft, but even when he put all the ingredients in the crafting grid neither miso nor soy sauce were listed on the menu. But the others were more surprised by the big tool that Kosuka earlier pulled out from his inventory. They then asked what was he gonna make first. Well he was still unable to make either of them now, but he can make these two things. The girls then wonder what was he making? Kosuka then makes kinko and soy sauce which are made from beans that are highly nutritious. The girls think they can use kinko for variety of things. And as for soy milk it kind of smells but it looks like it would be good for your body. But still Kosuka wonders why can't he make other things. Was it because of the cooking space or maybe he was still missing some ingredients? Well if he remember correctly in order to let it ferment after boiling and steaming he will need a barrel. The girls then bring some barrels to him, which he puts in his inventory. So now it looks like he might be able to make them after all. After a while there were two barrels filled with miso and soy sauce on the floor, and the girls began tasting each sauce. But Kosuka was more baffled by how 200 grams of soybeans got 20 kilograms in soy sauce. The law of conservation of mass here was all over the place. Eira then asks Kosuka how he made this. He then explains them about steaming and fermenting process after adding salt and malt. Hearing about the fermenting process the girl asks if he can also make alcohol. Kosuka then looks through his crafting menu, and it seems making alcohol was possible. Everyone then asks him to quickly make some, but he can't possibly add more stuff in this kitchen there won't be any more space for the girls to work. Then what about using a corner of the plaza? Kosuka then thinks about it, and it seems it could be possible. Later at the afternoon, some girls brought the grapes and barley for Kosuka at the plaza, so then he starts to craft alcohol. After the preparation was complete, Aira asks how long would it take? Well ale could take around 8 minutes. So when it was complete, Kosuka adds a tap to the barrel and fills up a cup of ale. When he looks back a lot of people were slowly gathering and it seems he would have to prepare everyone's share, which made the others quite happy. The plaza then slowly began to fill up with ale distiller and people began to chug down the new awesome drinks. He then asks if everyone had a drink. Well the people are surely seems to be enjoying it. So Kosuka too began to have his fill and it really tasted quite good and the people began to enjoy their time. Sir Lionel and Sylphie comes by wondering what was going on. They then tell them about how Kosuka-san was handing out ale to everyone. Sylphie then takes a sip, and it really tasted good to her. It was his first time drinking ale, but it was not bad. Sir Lionel also compliments him stating his ale is quite good compared to the cheap alesh from the taverns. Hearing that made Kosuka wonder how scary is the outskirt taverns. Gerda and the others then came by asking if they were really drinking ale? Well that's right it is a high grade ale that Kosuka made, so everyone was welcome to drink. Sylphie then thinks about calling those who aren't here to let them drink with everyone. So after receiving the princess permission they began to have a party. Slowly the plaza was filled up, and everyone seems to be enjoying the ale. The girls were also drinking up, and the harpies began singing. The drunk Sylphie then came by asking why Kosuka wasn't drinking? Well he have to make ale for everyone so, suddenly he notices Aira who was shocked by how the fermentation of the ale was so uniform. 
She gave him the blank look stating there's no way fermentation can be this uniform in every barrel. Kosuka then looks back and realizes how everyone was letting loose and it was getting merrier. But he will definitely get smashed if someone were to force him to drink so he decided to slip away once he gets the opportunity. Danan then comes up and asks Kosuka what was going on. He then spots Silphie enjoying the party. Kosuka then gives him a cup of ale cause if Silphie is already plastered so there's nothing he can do. Danan then looks at the cup and chugs it down. He then asks Kosuka for another cup. And just like that the day come to an end. The next day, people in the plaza were still hammered. And Kosuka and Silphie were in their room. While Silphie was laying in the bed buck naked. Kosuka was crafting something. Finally he was done making a weapon for himself. It was a beautiful dagger made out of mithril. But suddenly he was surprised by Era's sudden visit. While well, she came to talk with the princess. But Silphie was completely wasted. So Era grabbed Kosuka's hand. And asks him to follow to a corner. There he lays down wondering what was going on. Well, Aira did say that she would pamper him once he was back. Although it's a bit embarrassing, but she is just fine with seeing Kosuka's face. Hearing that he too gets embarrassed, then suddenly Silphie interrupts asking is this what Kosuka enjoy? Seeing her he gets nervous, and as he was trying to explain, her stare was digging in deep. She then sits on the sofa and emotes them to sit as well. Later when they sit together Kosuka could feel the heavy air. He then wonders what should he do at the times like these. Silphie then speaks up stating there's something they need to talk about. Kosuka then wonders what kind of talk it is. Well it's the kind of talk about how to divide Kosuka. Divide. Kosuka sweats in fear. Well yeah they have decided to divide Kosuka in the middle and Silphie will get the left half and Aira will get the right. Kosuka then nervously wonders if they are joking. Silphie then asks if Aira would like to have him during day and she will have him during the night. But it doesn't sound fair to Aira because she too wants some action. They then came up with a plan to take turns every day, which sounds fair to Aira. They then asked Kosuka if he have anything to add, because his opinion matters too. He then thinks about it, and tells them that it would be better if they can get along like how sisters would. Hearing that Silphie tells Aira to just call her by her name, and Aira end up calling her Silphie Neisama. They both then starts to undress, and Aira brings out a certain potion which she prepared herself. And now it was time to use that on Kosuka, who was still confused about what was happening. But he couldn't say anything because he was very quickly ravaged by them. And as for my cultured viewers, it's on chapter 34. Later at the command center of the frontier keep, everyone were arriving for the meeting. Kosuka then came while carrying Aira cause she couldn't move her legs, while Silphie seems very embarrassed by it. Danan tells them he wasn't bothered so just take a seat. He then starts the meeting with a proposal to change the plans. Everyone then wonders what it was about. Sir Lionel then asks what does he exactly have in his mind. Well the new plan that he have is to proactively take back all the forts that are within their territory. So what do they think about it? With this we are caught up with the chapters. For any future updates click the subscribe button and ring the bell icon. And if you want to enjoy some other adventure check out the other videos in my channel. Until next time, bye.